Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm particularly pleased to be here this afternoon because many years ago, I was a student here. I actually lived in Hester's Way and was in our school for about five years. So it was the start of my working life from here. And today, I'm starting a new phase in my working life, which is getting involved in politics in an active way for the first time. One of the things that I think is really important is that we should participate. The definition of freedom, the definition is to be able to participate and to influence. So I echo what your teachers were saying earlier. This is important for you to get to know us and to think, to think for yourselves about what you hear and what you think is worth voting for. I've been a Cheltenham girl all my life, worked here, lived here. So this town is very close to my heart, but I've not been involved actively in politics before. One of the things that I would say to you is very much that I feel one of the reasons I'm involved in politics is because politics has become narrow. When I was younger, there were quite distinct differences between political parties, which no longer seem to exist. And certainly, many of the parties that you will be able to vote for will have a particular philosophy and ideology. There'll be differences around the periphery, but the main objectives will remain the same. In UKIP, we're actually saying it's time to bring back democracy, which actually means having real choice. After all, Russia had lots of elections that you could only ever vote for a communist state. So we need to widen our democracy to retain it. The other thing that I think is important that you should know UKIP stands for is it stands very much for having sovereignty. The House of Commons of Laws, sorry, the House of Commons uh, booklet, which was issued in 2010, showed that something like 53% of our laws are made by Europe. Hi everybody, um, my name is Martin Horwood, You've, um, many of you have met me here before uh, and you always give me a you know, very thorough grilling every time I come. Um, I'm kind of looking forward to this but a little bit of trepidation. I was born and brought up in Cheltenham, I lived and worked in this town before I became an MP, before I even became a candidate uh, and Cheltenham matters hugely to me and I have friends and family in every part of town including in, in Hester's Way and around here. The vision I have for Cheltenham, really, is of uh, both a, a town that's economically strong, but also one that is a fairer and more equal town. Um, I'm constantly uh, shocked when I meet people and introduce myself as the MP for Cheltenham at how affluent and rich they think this town is. And we just know that that is only one part of the picture. It is part of the picture in some parts of this town. We have 1% one, we have one percent uh, most uh, affluent neighbourhoods in the, in the entire country in two parts of Cheltenham. But we also have areas where people have to work really hard to make ends meet. So it's about strengthening the economy, and that's something the coalition government has managed to do at national level. We've cut that deficit. We've taken what was a bit of an economic basket case five years ago and delivered some of the strongest economic growth in Europe now. But it's also supporting the Lib Dem Council, which has leveraged investment in things like the brewery and the North Place uh, area of Cheltenham will do more in, in other areas like Cheltenham Spa Station. And it's part of the MP's job to really be behind those kind of investments. And that's meant supporting over the years investments here in this school, in the neighbourhood project in Hester's Way, in the new Gloucestershire College campus and things <coughs> like that. But I also want this to be a fairer and more equal town. And we'll probably have uh, the chance during the questions to explore how we could do that. Uh, but it means... Um, being fair to all those, and I think in contrast to UKIP, being a more open and tolerant town as well, including to those who come from other countries or who have different minority uh, backgrounds, and that's a crucial part of making this a fairer town as well. Thanks very much. And now the Conservatives Thank you very much. Thank you, Jack. Um, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. So my name is Alex Chalk. I'm standing to be the Conservative Member of Parliament. Now I'm going to start with an apology to Martin because he's heard this before. Um, it's really important when you're standing that people get to know who you are. And I've knocked on doors. I knocked on doors about a year ago. This lady opened the door and she said, um, oh, yeah, I know who you are. She goes, you might be better than your brother, 
but we don't want David Miliband here either. So I want to make crystal clear to you, I'm not, in fact, uh, David Miliband. Um, so just a little bit about me, and then I'll say a little bit about my vision, if I may. So I'm 38 years old, married, got two children. I live in Cheltenham. I was um, brought up locally, a um, little village called Foxcote nearby, which um, but I'm going to call Greater Cheltenham, if that's all right. <laughs> so uh, I grew up, um, grew, grew up locally. I'm not a career politician. I'm a barrister by profession. And indeed, I've come here to speak to a number of the students here about some of the work that I do, which is principally in the areas of counter-terrorism, uh, serious fraud, I work for the serious fraud office from time to time, financial conduct authority, and homicide. So that's um, everything from uh, murder through manslaughter to traffic matters to um, all, all that sort of thing. So that's the kind of background that I come from. I have some experience for eight years of, of being a local councillor as well. So that's just a, a whistle-stop tour through who I am. In terms of the vision, first of all, I'm absolutely passionate about Cheltenham. I really think this is the most incredible place to live. But if I may just briefly echo some of the things that Martin mentioned. There are issues in this town. There is, I think, an unacceptable polarization between areas of real affluence and areas of relative deprivation. And the way we deal with that, in my view, is having a relentless focus on opportunity, opportunity, opportunity. I want to see us focusing on infrastructure so that we get our fair share of whether it's road infrastructure, rail infrastructure. But we need to balance that too with things like having a strong acute hospital here and protecting things like green spaces which are important. So let's have a strong economy and the strong services which are so important to our town. Thank you. Uh, next, we have sorry, Adam Vancouver. Uh, he's representing the Green Party. Thank you very much. Um, yes, my name is Adam Vancouver. Um, as my name probably doesn't suggest, I am a native of Cheltenham. I was born and raised here. Um, and I now work um, here and live in Hadley with my wife and my young son. Um, interesting hearing about the other candidates talking about the kind of the deprivation and the two sides of Cheltenham. I think that's ex that's very true, and I think that should be something that all candidates are interested in looking into. Um, I can maybe talk from um, more personal experience of that kind of thing. Um, I was raised very locally, so I lived on council estates around in Cheltenham. Um, I grew up in Hester's Way, so not far from here. Um, my uncles and mum came to our school here, and then after that I moved to the Arl Farm Estate as well, which um, um, is just down the road from here. Um, and, it, and it's very tough kind of growing up in a single parent family and actually sometimes having a choice between do we put money in the electricity meter or do we actually have some, you know, some dinner tonight, that kind of thing. These are very real choices, and the thing is, these are situations sometimes that are out of people's control as well. So it's, it's a shame to sometimes hear certain political rhetoric that goes into demonising those on benefits, demonising the unemployed, demonising those from, from minorities and things like that. And the reason I'm in the Green Party is that not just because we want environmental justice, but because we're passionate about social justice as well. We want a society, we want an economy that doesn't leave anyone behind. It's no good being able to spout that we've got economic success, that we've got a high GDP, if we're leaving people behind in poverty, if we're leaving people behind completely in our society and they're disengaging with politics as well. Um, so the one reason I'm standing pretty much this time, because I'm, I'm not a politician at all, I'm, I'm just a, a normal working bloke from Cheltenham, I wanted to make sure there was a Green Party candidate on the ballot for Cheltenham this year, and I, I had to be the person to kind of be, you know, to be on the ballot there, I had to be the person to give that choice. So we're offering something very different from the other parties. We're standing against austerity, we're standing, standing against privatisation, and we're standing for actually doing something about impending environmental disaster. Thank you. My name is Richard Lupson Darnell. I'm an independent candidate. I'm an independent because I don't feel that any of the parties that are before you speak for me and what I believe in. I was born in Essex, proud of Essex, lived here for four years um, with my family. Um, I just want to say, at 7 o'clock on the morning of 7th of May, the polling stations will open and we all start here with zero votes. Don't let anybody tell you who you can and can't win here. When that hap what then happens is completely up to you guys, your families and the people of Cheltenham. What this country lacks, in my opinion, is vision. They've talked about vision, but I think we lack vision. Vision, in my terms, is hope for a future that is better for all of us to live in, not a picture of fear. I have a vision for this country and for our town. A country where the government and the economy completely exist for us, to serve us. A country where your dreams and the things that you guys want to do with your lives are valued and encouraged. 
a country where the poorest among us are the first thought, not an afterthought, and a country where both individually and collectively we care as much for those around us as we do for ourselves. This is not, in my view, the culture we live in. So what would that vision look like, say, next week in Cheltenham? One example, the council have a decision to make about £8 million worth of spending. And my view is that they should spend that on a new nighttime homeless shelter, rather than on doing up Neptune's fountain. This election is about real people. It's not about us sat up here. It's not about Europe or immigration, the economy, big business, or the city of London. It's about you. It's not about some of you. It's about all of you. If you want what you've always got, then vote for the parties we've always had. If you want to buy into a vision of your lives and this nation that is transformed, vote independent on the 7th of May. Now we're going to start with questions. Um, the first question on universities from Michaela Barry. Yeah, I mean, I think part of the answer to this is the general strength of the economy. If, if you have a healthy economy, a stronger economy, then you will have more jobs to go around. That's an inevitable uh, consequence. So I think the work the coalition government has done to, to build us a strong economy is important, and the work that Cheltenham Borough Council has done to generate investment and bring investment into the town is important. As the MP, you can also do more individually. At this morning, I was launching a jobs club, a jobs fair um, in, the, in the municipal offices, and that was about bringing together a whole range of companies from M&S to TSB to a whole load of people who were offering jobs for, for local people. And so that's important. Um, it's also important to protect the jobs we've got. And actually, later on, sadly, I was meeting a trade union representative talking about the jobs at Vibixa, uh, which Weetabix has closed down and is currently actually restricting the amount of days off that people facing redundancy can take in training and things like this. So you have a, a variety of ways in which you can support and try and defend jobs. But it's not just about graduates, I'd have to say. One of the best things this government has done, and I'm really proud of this because it was one of our priorities going into the coalition, is to champion apprenticeships. And actually you had at this jobs fair this morning, you had companies like GE who have about 36 apprenticeships on offer. You have com companies like Myra who've made, um, and uh, Spirax Sarko in this town, who I've supported in trying to get apprenticeships going as well. So you don't have to go to university to have a, a, an effective career path. And actually, I have to say, some of the uh, sort of older teenagers that I've met in apprenticeships have been some of the most mature and capable people that I've ever met locally. Um, so I would really plug the apprenticeship route as well as just the uni route. But certainly, um, I'm, I've been very active in trying to get investment into the town, trying to vote for a stronger economy at national level, but also trying to support that at local level too. Uh, Adam, uh, Alex. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, unsurprisingly, quite a lot of that I, I agree with, <clears throat> certainly in respect of uh, apprenticeships, which are massively important. There have been over 2,000 apprenticeships here in Cheltenham. Now, it's right to say in Gloucester there have been 4,000, but it's starting from a, a lower base. But that's a very important part, and equally, the comments that were made about a strong economy is absolutely essential. If we don't have a strong economy, if people aren't employing people, then the opportunities for you... Are, and, and people like you are not there. But, but, but there is a really important um, issue here. And that is, although there is a national fight that takes place, we are competing in a global race. Here in Cheltenham too, and this is what the question was directed at, we've got to make sure that we punch our weight as well. Now how do we do that? How do we go about creating opportunities across our town, making it a town of opportunity overall? Well, I think there's one thing that we really need to focus on, and that is infrastructure. If we can improve the infrastructure of this town, by that I mean a better railway station, if we can get things like the A417 missing link, then do you know what? It puts this town economically on the map. And that's critically important because if people can get to here, people see what a fabulous place it is. I know, let's set up my uh, factory or service centre, whatever it is, here and to create that, those kinds of jobs. Now, I, I have to say, um, I, I don't feel that we've done as much as we could have done over the last 20 years. The railway station, for example, isn't as good as it should be. It's missing investment. 
Um, our road network, the A417, thank goodness we got some funding for it. But we have to focus absolutely resolutely on that and broadband as well to try to give us jobs here in China. So that's what I'd say. Infrastructure matters. Um, now, think... Yes, yeah, really good question. It's, it's quite a multifaceted one as well. Um, the system we've got at the moment um, is almost like a conveyor belt. You're kind of expected to, to go to school, you're expected to go to university, you're expected to go and get a graduate job. And that was a conveyor belt I found myself on 10, 12 years ago. Um, I think with the advent of, of higher tuition fees, I think that puts far more pressure on, on things to go in that kind of very ordered route. Um, and I'd like to say that if, if we were living in a society where, as the Green Party would like to do, um, get rid of tuition fees and actually provide a citizen's income for all citizens. Going to university wouldn't necessarily be something you had to do at 18. It could be something you kind of could try later on in your life and, and still actually get a call to do so. So I'd like to, I don't quite like the idea that university is not for everyone. I think university should be available to anyone, but I mean absolutely anyone as well. I think there's perfectly viable options to not go to university and I've got many friends who are um, earning, you know, reasonable amounts of money while I was still actually you know, living in student digs and eating tins of baked beans. Um, there's nothing wrong with that as an option. I, I think pushing um, more apprenticeships and things like that is a fantastic idea. I don't think anyone here is going to agree with that. Um, but I think we should actually see universities still being available to everyone but not being the feel and end all. Um, so something like Citizens Income that the Green Party are looking at would actually make it um, more viable for anyone to go to university. Um, in terms of jobs, I think we have to look at the kind of jobs we've got. Um, one thing, I'm not going to nick from Alex, but one thing that he said in his election literature is the idea of maybe making Cheltenham a technological hub. Oh, yeah, sure. Make, there you go. Thank you, yeah. So, so Chel Cheltenham <laughs> is a place where people come to do business, where, where Cheltenham is a place where, you know, it's like a mini Silicon Valley. I'd like to take it on a step further, and I'd love the idea of Cheltenham being a green technological hub. If we shift the economy towards actually working for people, working for the environment, Cheltenham, for example, could be a place where people actually are coming here because this is where the environmental expertise is. Whereas at the moment, I mean, out of 120 people in my year group at Pace, I think I barely know half a dozen who still work in Cheltenham. They've all moved to London. So I, I, I echo some of what they've said, but I'd like to take it further and put an environmental kind of inside. Thank you. Next, can I have one? Right. Okay. The phone a bit there. There we go. Um, I... I I cannot help but agree with, with, with an awful lot that has been said. I love the idea of a technology hub. Um, I would probably add um, one more um, point, and I think it's about you guys. You know, I think what I would be looking to do is encourage more collaboration coming from you. Um, there's a lot that government can do. But what about um, coming out of university? Um, we need to incentivize you to start thinking about setting up your own businesses and, and working together. And that can be a cross-discipline, as all businesses need. You need people that will be doing what, you, what each one of you is passionate about. Um, but for me, this really starts back in year seven. Um, if we really are wanting everybody to be doing um, and working to their fullest. What we need to be doing is identifying the dreams and the longings and the passions that all of you guys have, so that when you get to year 13, you know exactly what it is that you want to do, because it's in your core, it's what you know you are, you are here to do. So often, so many people, and I was the same, left school not knowing, I didn't have a clue what I wanted to do, because I hadn't been given the language and the tools to do that. And I think that's a hugely important thing that we can add um, in to the education system. What, of course, I'm talking about is a very, very long-term thing. But I think so much of what we talk about um, and what politicians have talked about historically has been so short-term. It's been short-term thinking, looking towards the next election, or if, if less than that, the next news cycle. So I believe that we need to give you guys the tools to know what it is that you're here to do, what it is that your life is all about. And um, once that happens, then a lot of this will be addressed. Thank you. And finally, from Christine. Yeah, I think uh, I would agree to a degree with what Richard's saying, uh, but it's about you guys being involved as well, because you need to be selective in your choices of what you study and what you learn. This country has certain jobs areas where it's known that there will be jobs for the future. The government themselves have published some figures on, on this, some suggestions on this. 
particularly, for instance, in care and health. Um, there are many other high-tech areas where it's saying there will be jobs in our economy in the future. So when you're considering no, what you might... Not out of Europe, actually. You decimate the British economy. Absolute rubbish, but we'll come back to that. <laughs> what we would say is... Two and a half million jobs at risk. Absolute rubbish again. That is such data, data that it's unbelievable. And it's also rubbish by the people who put it together. What I was trying to say, if I may speak without interruption for a moment, is you need to be choosing the things that you want to study which are actually going to be relevant to the economy of the future. And high tech, medicine, science, those sorts of things are where you will find jobs in the future whether they're created in Cheltenham or anywhere else in our economy or even across the world. I would suggest to you that the UK taxpayer should be asking for something back for their investment in your university studies. So that's why you could have said that any student who wants to study medicine, science, engineering, IT, those will be absolutely free. They will have no tuition fees at all. And when you come out, the quid pro quo is that you work for the British economy for something like four or five years, and then you're free to do whatever you will, wherever you will in the world. But focus on the things where you know there's growth coming in our economy when you're thinking about your future. Thank you for your answers. The next topic is the economy, and the question is coming from A. Hewitt. It has been reported that the MOD may cut our armed forces to 60,000 due to cutbacks, when we as a country have been placed on severe for a potential terrorist attack. Do you not think we should cut back on more different things within our economy? Yeah, I, um, and it, this is a really, really important uh, issue, and speaking for myself, uh, I would be in favour of us keeping to the 2% of GDP, which is what NATO asks of its member states, to spend on defence. It seems to me that in an increasing we'll come back to that in, a moment, in an increasingly uncertain world, it's critically important we have strong armed forces, and I would want to be a voice for that. I think it is important, however, to note that a lot of the really important work that uh, is done in keeping us safe is partly the armed forces, but it's, a lot of it is the security service as well. We know a little bit about that down the road, don't we? But also um, the security service and, and uh, MI5. So there's been a lot of additional funding that has been put into those services since 2010, and that is a critical part of it. And some of the work that I do in, in that field, I know fine well that they are doing an incredible job at, uh, at harnessing the data and keeping us uh, safe. But look, if it, were to, if it were down to me, I would not be in favour of reducing the military and to the extent that it's taken place. If we want to remain a global force, if we want to remain on the Security Council, if we want to remain an active member of NATO, then I think we have to take some tough decisions and ensuring that our armed forces are properly equipped and properly resourced is critical to keeping us safe and making the world a better place too. Yeah, I can, so from the Green Party point of view, I can see some of the rationale behind this. I think uh, even if we're not in the Green Party, we've got to realise that if we're going to have an armed force in this country, it's got to be fit for the 21st century. There's no point having an armed force that's fit for the 19th century, it's fit for the Cold War. I think part of that is down to the fact that wars are not fought like wars have been fought in the last 150 years. I completely agree with Alex that I think actually these days we're looking at um, wars fought, um, no, through intelligence means, through cyber means and things like that. Wars just aren't boots on the ground and, and your troops lining up against my troops anymore. So from my perspective, I think, um, you know, although it's always a terrible thing to see jobs cut, I think actually if we want to, to focus on war in the 21st century, on defence in the 21st century, we should actually be moving what we're doing into the intelligence services a bit more. I, I'd probably put a whole load of caveats on that from the Green Party perspective. But I think where what we're very good at in this country is having um, a very efficient and very well-run intelligence service. I think I'd like to see a lot more safeguards around what they're doing and, and what they can do, um, but I think broadly I'd, I'd put it that way. Uh, another thing I'd link into the fact that we, we need to make sure that we've got a modern military force fit for this age is the fact that we still have nuclear weapons in this country which are costing us billions and billions of pounds. In a time where we're told that we're having to cut our cloth to suit how much we've got, 
I think uh, something like trying the nuclear weapon system we've got is, is an unfathomable luxury that we don't need. You know, this is not the 1950s. This is not, you know, the Bay of Pigs. It's not the Cuban Missile Crisis. It's not the 1980s with Russia with their finger over button. Us um, being the size that we are, I think we need to realise that maybe we actually need to punch our weight and not try and punch above it at the detriment of our own economy. Okay. <clears throat> um, I, I agree with a lot, of, a lot of what has been said, um, but I think part of the essence of the question was, um, should we be cutting here when we could be cutting somewhere else? I think my, my reaction to that, this is under, you know, under the heading of the economy, is that we shouldn't be cutting half as much as we are anyway, if at all. There's a huge pool of tax out there that isn't being collected, which nobody wants to talk about or throw money at. Um, there's £120 billion, some estimates say, between the tax that is actually owed and the tax that is collected in this country. The government say it's about £30 billion. I think it's somewhere in between. So in terms of the question of, of uh, whether we should be cutting in a different area, um, I think I've probably answered that one. But the, to answer the specifics about the MOD, um, <coughs> it's a different kind of war. I'm just going to echo what the guys have said. Um, things have changed since the time that I was sitting where you are, you know, when wars were fought in a conventional way, you know, Falklands was, um, which was when I was um, your age. And the thing now is that it's very difficult to tell when we're in a time of war and a time of peace. It used to be very, very easy to, to, to say that and differentiate. And now, pretty much, you could say we're on a permanent war for Um But it is an intelligence war. It's not a troops on the ground war. As far as I'm concerned, we should be defending our borders. Um, and I think our borders, first and foremost, are our physical ones, not, not necessarily overseas. Um, but we do still need that element, and I think that's an intelligence element. As far as our level of armed forces are concerned, we need to protect our borders, but I also think that we need to still be involved in peacekeeping operations under the UN. Um, much more than that, I think we just need to help people when they ask for it, which is why I support what we're doing in Iraq at the moment. Okay. <clears throat> the reason we're cutting the defence budget is because it's an easy hit. It's one of those things which is not usually very popular with the voters in exchange for health or schooling. And therefore, it's one of those easy ones to actually strip the budget from. But the question is very, very valid. We are facing a threat which is almost unknown in quantity. We just don't know how it's going to hit us and where from. So I'd agree with some of my colleagues here who've actually said we need more intelligence-led, um, as it were, military toughness. But the other part of it is, increasingly, we are being asked as a nation, and volunteering even, to get involved in foreign adventures. And some of those things mean that we have to put people on the ground. You can use smartphones and all sorts of clever technology, but ultimately, many of our senior military people have said it's down to needing a certain number of troops because some of our people have been doing excessively uh, long tours of duty or more duty tours than they should normally have done in any given period. That puts strain and stress on them, which is unfair. So I think, yes, we owe the duty to the military. One of the things UK wants to do is to restore that military covenant, which actually says we will look after the people who are looking after us. But I think there is enough key there. And I think one of the things that we ought to be looking at is the security of our own borders here. And that's something which our current government and the one before have dismally failed to do. And so that, I'm afraid, is giving us more grief than we might otherwise have. So, yeah, I take the point of this question. We are under a severe threat. And it's down to all of us to try and manage that threat by involving and including our society as one society and not a fragmented one. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little surprised um, Christina hasn't actually pointed out that the UK policy is to quite significantly increase uh, spending on defence. And that, of course, in a situation where all the political parties just about uh, want to 
carry on trying to balance our books. We're still overspending in government. We're still spending more than we're uh, actually raising, by about £100 billion pounds a year. That would inevitably mean, from UKIP, cuts in the NHS. It would mean cuts in local council services. It would mean cuts in schools. So you can't have your cake and eat it, I'm afraid. And um, Alex is doing a little bit of smoke and mirrors here, because actually George Osborne, the Conservative Chancellor, has published his forward spending plans, and they accept that that's going to be the case, that actually defence spending as a percentage of GDP will have to fall. The 60,000 um, in the question, the reduction in the armed forces, that's actually a reduction in regular troops. We are trying to balance that, and we've been trying to balance that as a coalition government, by recruiting massively more reserve uh, soldiers and making the reserves part of the army in a, in a much more organised way than before. And that's partly about having a more responsive army and a more responsive armed forces to the kind of threats that we are seeing at the moment. And I agree with the others that that isn't just about boots on the ground. And in fact, if you look at the Iraq war, we had a massive intervention in what was actually at the time a peaceful country, allegedly to try and stop threats to this country. Um, but actually, by the time we've come out of it, what are we left with now? We've got a massively bigger insurgency from ISIS who are going around burning people alive, murdering people, uh, targeting uh, Christian and other minorities. So uh, we've ended up within a worse situation. And actually, what we need to do is build stability overseas. We need to invest in things like overseas development, actually, to try and increase prosperity and tolerance in these countries as well. And absolutely right, invested in places like GCHQ, which is doing a fantastic job in the front line on the internet and elsewhere in countering terrorism. And we need to get smart about our security, not just spend more money on boots on the ground. Thank you. Now a question on the NHS from Kelsey Cable. Is the closure of the A and E department at Cheltenham General simply a cost-cutting exercise, and is more and is this more evidence of the private privatisation of the NHS and the jobs in the local area? Just before I start this, I'll take a quick straw poll from the other candidates if I can. So, who out of the five of you today would want the reinstatement of full A and E provision in Cheltenham? Brilliant. So, so we're all agreed on that. So, so there's going to be an argument for many of us on that one. Um, and I don't think, I've, I've not spoken to anyone in Cheltenham, I don't know if any of you have on your actual campus who, who disagree with that so far. Actually, so that is a big priority for people in Cheltenham and a massive worry. Um, a town of this size to, to not have its own 24 hour, seven day a week any provision is a massive worry to some people, especially if you live on the other side of Cheltenham, if you're kind of living in, you know, Charlton Kings or, you know, um, St Paul's or somewhere like that. The, I, the idea of having to get an ambulance from there across onto the A40, across to the other side of Gloucester, kind of is, is a big worry. We're talking about maybe adding 10, 15, possibly 20 minutes onto a journey or something. And we know that this is absolutely crucial, especially in, you know, the, the reason you've called an ambulance is because it is a life-threatening event. You know, you're not just calling the ambulance because you've stubbed your toe. So, um, so that, that scares the heck out of me, to be perfectly honest. Um, I, I, I don't like the idea of that at all. Um, the question, uh, is, I don't think it's simplistic as being a cost-cutting exercise. So we're, we're told that, you know, this is down to clinical evidence says there, there are clinical benefits to not having it open too often. But I think if we kind of draw back, this is where we might diverge a bit as candidates. The reasoning behind this, I think, ultimately is down to the fragmentation and the privatisation that's occurring within the NHS. This is driving away doctors from working in A&E departments. This is driving away doctors from becoming GPs and things like that. Um, I've got a friend who, um, who is a locum, so he's kind of working almost, you know, it's almost the GP equivalent of a supply teacher pretty much. These locums are supplied by um, a private firm. So this private firm takes some money every time they hire him out to a hospital as well. He's not keen on it, but working as a locum works for him, but he's not got much choice other than working for this private company. Every time that he's kind of working somewhere and treating someone, that's taking money out of the NHS. And I think that long term, this, this top-down reorganisation of the NHS we've got, which, which David Cameron promised was not going to happen, has happened. It's fragmenting the NHS, we're relying on important doctors in from elsewhere, and we're driving out doctors that we're training into other professions, into other countries as well. So I think Sorry, short, short term I want the A&E back, but long term we need to solve some other problems to make that happen, I think. Thank you. Uh, Richard, if you Absolutely. I can't, there's very little to, um, to disagree with Adam on. And, um, 
Yeah, I don't believe the downgrade of the, of the A and E department is um, specifically due to, to do with cost cutting um, or creeping privatisation. Um, to me, it seems to be a management issue. Um, you know, what they consider to be the best resource, the use of resources that are available at the moment. Um, but it, it, there is a funding, fundamental funding issue um, with the NHS. Um, and the need, as I see it, is um, more and better managed resources. I think there is, as I say, a management issue. Um, there was a King's um, Fund report out today, um, a think tank that basically said that the reorganisation had left us without expertise at every, every level of the NHS. Um, and I think that is partly because we're just not paying the people um, that we depend on. Um, and I've got very recent experience of depending on all of these guys, um, what, um, what we should be. Um, so morale in the NHS, you know, I talked to my GP recently, um, and it's through the floor. Um, and she said, don't quote me, but yeah, the morale is through the floor. It's very, very low, um, which makes what the staff do in our NHS all the more remarkable. Um, and we need to stop taking that for granted. But as, as far as the A&E department is concerned, we need it back, and we need it back um, 24 hours. Um, our town is too big to not have it. Yeah, well, I couldn't disagree with that at all. Um, a town of our size should have a fully functioning A&E department. Um, I can see the logic of centralising specialisms in one area or another um, for clinical excellence reasons but not A&E, uh, because A&E is by definition not something that you can anticipate and plan for. Um, is it about privatisation of the NHS? Arguably, the Labour government presided over the biggest privatisation of the NHS through the uh, private finance initiative, PFI. Um, so many contracts were issued which are going to be costing all of us, all of you particularly, a lot of money over the next generation. And, unfortunately, we won't even own the buildings at the end of it. They will belong still to the people who built them and we'll still be paying rent on them. So we, we are in a bit of a class stick there. One of the things you could have said is we want, where possible, locally, if it's feasible, to buy back these PFIs so that we take back the ownership into the public domain. That's something that we feel quite clearly and quite definite about. One of the other things I want to knock on the head before anybody else may raise this issue, we have never suggested that people should have to pay to go and see their GP. And we have never suggested that the services, whomsoever may deliver them, should be paid for. They should always be free for people who need to use them at the point of need. So there is no question that we are intending at all to privatise the NHS. In fact, we'd like to reverse some of that which has gone before, if it's at all feasible to do so. I agree, we need our AME back, and I would hopefully, there's so much campaigning going on, hopefully, hopefully, hopefully somebody will listen, but I wouldn't guarantee it. And yet, Nigel Farage, who's the leader of UKIP, said that we should consider a private insurance model to replace the current NHS funding model. And the logic of UKIP policies is to spend less overall, more on defence, and therefore, logically, it must mean less on uh, the NHS non Well, if I may interrupt you, Martin, as you interrupted me, Nigel said stop, stop. we want to put three million, three billion pounds into the NHS just to help it out of the hole it's in at the moment, well, which is the, actually more the than the coalition has said. The, short, the shortfall identified by the Stevens report is eight billion, and the Liberal Democrats are the only party that is committed to meet that, because we are prepared to do something UKIP isn't, which is to actually increase taxes like capital gains tax, the mansion tax, and so on, in order to not just cut spending, but also increase taxation, in order to balance the books. As I said before, you can't have your cake and eat it. The, the issue in Cheltenham is not uh, financial. Um, Ch Gloucestershire Hospitals Trust actually runs a surplus at the moment, so this wasn't a financial pressure. It's not about privatisation either. Um, Labour actually had 3% of NHS services uh, run by private providers. That's gone up 1.5%, that's all, under this last government. And certainly there's no suggestion of A&E being privatised in Cheltenham. It is about some local management decisions. This downgrade at night, it's not closing, by the way, it's still open 
It's still open as a full service A&E most of the day, but between 8 p.m. and 8 a.m., uh, you now don't get blue light admissions and there aren't doctors on call. I think that's making the situation worse. I think some of the other decisions, they had a brilliant system, and rather foolish, this is a really silly thing to call it, they called it Utopia, which is a system uh, which hasn't worked of shifting all unplanned admissions, and I know this is happening because it happened with me and my, an elderly relative of mine over Christmas, all unplanned admissions into A&E to see a doctor. And that clogs up the system at times of high pressure like we've just had. So there are local management decisions behind this. There are other issues like the 111 service where you phone up and they say, you well, better be safe, go to A&E. So there are problems to be sorted, but it's not about privatisation and it's not about money. Right, okay, a few points. First of all, absolutely right that we should have a fully functioning A&E here. It's critically important, it bears emphasis, that we're not talking about, at the moment, the complete closure of the A&E department. It's part um, early but the reason why it's so important to mention that is because both Martin and I are aware that there is an internal document, maybe it's draft, maybe it doesn't indicate the direction of travel, but some may think it does, which indicates that the proposal is to centralise all emergency surgery on one site. And you can bet your bottom dollar if that happens, it ain't going to be Cheltenham. So it's really important that we understand what the situation is now and what it could be, because that should inform the way we go about planning our defence for the better expression. That's critically important. The second point is, you know, it's not to do with privatisation. And one of the things that came up from the King's Fund today is that those people who are saying, I'm sorry, I think that's me, those people who are saying that it's privatisation are uh, over, are gilding the lily, whatever the expression is. It's not the case. It's gone from about 4% to 5%. So that, beware of that siren call. It simply isn't the case. But the third and really important thing is this. We have to step back and look at ourselves as a country and what we can and can't do. Health is critically important, but it is also blooming expensive. And back in 2010, this country was a basket case, frankly, or getting close to being a basket case. <coughs> Could we pay for important things like healthcare, which incidentally cost about £120 billion a year. And in that time, notwithstanding the pressures we've been under, we have increased funding by £12 billion over that time. That is massively important. It means that the A&Es can actually um, treat 2,000 more people a day than used to be the case. Now, of course, there are issues in it, but we have to recognise that if we want to have a strong A&E and strong health service generally, we've got to be able to pay for it. And so that's why Act 1C1 of any, of any government has got to get a strong economy, reducing the tax revenues, so that we can even think about getting our A&E back in charge. So, Alex, why did the only Conservative councillor on the health overview and scrutiny committee actually vote for this downgrade to go ahead? Martin, that's completely misleading, as you know. It's not. It's not. If you have done councillors, you voted for it to be only temporary and to be reviewed again. And the one Conservative council on that committee <coughs> voted for it to go ahead. And actually, when I was on the, in the meeting where the decision was actually taken by NHS Gloucestershire, there was myself, there was the Lib Dem candidate from the Cotswolds, there was the local Cheltenham Chamber of Commerce arguing against this, presenting evidence against it. Not one Conservative, I mean, you were a candidate at the time and you know, maybe you were, you were busy doing your barristering thing, that's fair enough. But there was no local Tory councillor there to oppose it, with none of the other Tory MPs from Gloucestershire there to oppose it. We were a, we were a loving voice, and the Tories did back us up on that. Thank you. We're going to move on to our next topic. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I'll keep it short. Yeah, I'll keep it short. <laughs> well, okay, I'll keep it short. It's absolutely problems, but look, it's not necessarily misleading. The, re the real point is, you, you people are here to hear what my stance would be if I were to be a member of Parliament, indeed, what any of the people here, if they became a member of Parliament. All I can tell you is I will proverbially not literally die in a ditch to try to save Shelton Andy, and I will get out and I'll have a plan to try to protect it, because what, if I may say so, is the elephant in the room is notwithstanding this threat, not just the nighttime AD, the whole of AD, notwithstanding that, what is happening now to address that threat? So one minute and nothing. And that you may feel is absolutely hard. Why won't you let me do it? We shall move on. Should we have a point system like Australia where skills and qualifications are taken into account? No, right? So, I missed what Sophie was. Uh, Sophie, um, yeah, um, we need something like that. Um, we need um, 
We need a point system. The problem we've got, of course, is that we've got two different systems here and ways that we can approach this. We're part of the European Union, and that means that we, we've got one set of rules. Um, and then we've got people who are coming from outside the European Union. Um, See, so immigration, I feel, is a very positive thing um, and has been for centuries. Part of my family were, um, were from north of East Poland and came here and became tailors in the East End of London, um, employing loads of people, and I'm immensely proud of that. And of course, the NHS would have fallen apart years ago um, if we didn't have those who came here to be doctors and nurses um, and others as well. Um, but what we really need to know is what skills do we need? Christina alluded to them earlier, and I think she's right. Um, what skills do we need? And we need to adapt our system to make sure that they're the kind of people that we're attracting. Um, the problem, of course, as I said, is that we've got two different um, systems. Um, and, yeah, I think from the European Union perspective, uh, we need to renegotiate the free movement and, and what that means, the free movement of labour. Um, how we do that, you know, we could discuss um, forever in a day, but we, we need that to happen. We need a different set of rules. We need to be able to um, say that we need it on a needs basis, um, but we need to do that, and I'd argue we desperately need to do that from inside the European Union, not from outside the European Union. And um, I'm, I'm all for a referendum on Europe. I think everybody needs to fight their corner, even those who are fervently in favour. Um, it's something we desperately need to do. I'm personally in favour of staying in, um, because I think there's far too much at stake economically and jobs-wise for us to leave. Um, but we need to do the immigration thing from inside. Yeah, well, I partly agree with some of things Richard's been saying, of course, but I think one of the things we have to recognise is the fact that England is the most densely populated country in Europe. One of the reasons that we're having pressures on our services is because we have had a large number of people arriving in a very short period of time. So it's impossible for the infrastructure to keep up with it. One of the reasons I think we should have a points-based uh, entry system is because it is fairer. At the moment, the system we have, as we said, is the two-tier system. If you happen to uh, have a European passport, and some countries have been selling those passports to people who are not of their own uh, origin, those people have the right to come here and work and live without any qualification whatsoever. If you happen to be from India, Pakistan, um, Australia, anywhere else in the world, you can't come here without having some method of showing how you're going to support yourself, what you're going to do when you get here. It seems to me it's grossly unfair to discriminate against three quarters of the world coming here when the other bit of the world, that bit which is in Europe, can actually turn up whenever and however they wish. We need to manage our borders for several reasons. First and foremost, we need to manage the numbers of people coming here so that we can properly welcome them, actually give them the support they need and the services that when they get here they're reasonably entitled to for having provided. But we need to plan for that. You cannot plan for that down the line and have unlimited immigration from anywhere that chooses to come here. So a point system is fairer to everybody. And I would say we're better off outside of the European Union because the European Union have made it quite clear, Mrs. Merkel very clearly said, she's not going to renegotiate the free movement of peoples. And that's what we're talking about. Thank you. Um, I know people are worried about immigration, and it's a, it's a genuine concern. Um, I think it's actually sometimes ramped up by parties like UKIP, by some newspapers, and, and sometimes in the media. Because actually immigration does bring us real benefits as well. Um, if you imagine in this town, we've never have had, have had Gustav Holst if we haven't had immigration. We've never have had Brunel uh, building our railways. We've had no royal family if we didn't have immigration. Um, we've, never have, we've never have had Kobe Arthur and Raffaella De Vita doing their best to stop um, Chelton Town going down. I mean, it is a two-way street, and it's 
When you talk about uh, the countries outside the European Union, yes, actually, a point system is not a bad idea because we haven't negotiated the same arrangements with all these different uh, countries. So having some kind of rigorous system where you actually uh, look for the people with the skills to come in and support this uh, country's economy and this country's society is a smart way to do it. And actually, the coalition government has moved some way towards um, doing that. I think the Australian system in that context is quite a good one. So short answer is yes. Within the European Union, though, we, we managed to get a completely reciprocal arrangement with all these different countries, and it's a two-way street. And the people who come here to work are balanced by Brits going overseas to live and work. And actually, uh, many of the Brits who are overseas are rather older, retiring to places like Spain and Portugal and the Mediterranean. Uh, and if they all came back, as UKIP would want, and we didn't allow people to come in and work, we'd have a lot bigger strain on our NHS and things like that. But the point is, if God help us, UKIP got into power and detonated the economy by taking us out of the European Union, trust me, you might want the right to go and work in some of these other countries. And it is the opportunities that that offers of allowing people to come here and work, but also allowing you to go to France, to Germany, to the Netherlands, a more densely populated country than Britain, by the way. Um, that that two-way street is a massive benefit to us, not just as an economy, but as a society as well. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's true. It, it is the most dense But I, I do think that... Um, with respect, that the Liberal Democrats are being a little unfair to you, Kip Bond's wife. You keep on saying, I don't think anybody is saying, oh, you shouldn't have any immigration into this country. That is to caricature the position that there are a lot of people in this country who have perfectly legitimate concerns about having control of immigration so we make sure that, frankly, we can do right by people who come here as well. Because it's no good for people who do come here if there aren't the resources and facilities to everything from make them welcome to ensure that there is sufficient health service, education to accommodate them. So one's got to be careful not to caricature the debate. But look, the question is, should we have a point system like Australia where skills and qualifications taken into account? We do, actually. It's called the Highly Skilled Migrants Program, and it was replaced by the Tier 1 <laughs> system. I, I know that because I'm prosecuting someone for abusing it. And um, so it, it does exist. <laughs> um, basically, it, it, I'm not going to bore you with a law lesson about it, but it's been in, in place since February 2008. Yeah. And, um, for example, if you want to come in um, as a Tier 4 migrant, you have to satisfy, you have to get a certain number of points um, through what income you've generated. And the scam, the wheeze in this case was, is that you blag the, uh, you blag the income you've got, you just rotate it around, no money ever goes through, and you get these phony invoices to get your point. So the answer is actually we do um, have a system, and it, and it copies in some part what's existed in Australia since the 80s and Canada, in fact, since the 1960s. But look, the bigger point here, non-EU immigration and EU immigration. So far as non-EU immigration is concerned, that has, those levels have been reduced, in fact, to levels of approximately the 1990s. But as for Europe, what happens in Europe? People will have different points of view. Martin says, in whatever happens. UKIP say, out whatever happens. But there's got to be a referendum, because you folks, I think, have got to decide one way or the other what is in the national interest. And that's why I'm absolutely passionate that we should have that vote, we should deal with this issue, we should have the debate, and then you, the British people, should decide. Which way would you vote now? Well, I, I'm perfectly happy to answer that question. I'll get more time. It is absolutely about the national interest. What I would say is there's got to be a negotiation that takes place. Anybody who says, hang on, hang on, let me just do it if I can, I'm allowed. Um, anybody, anybody who says before the negotiation has taken place, oh yeah, I'm not going to listen to what happens, I'm in, or I'm not going to listen to what happens, I'm out. I think it's selling the national interest short. Let's see what's in our interest and afterwards vote that way. So I, I think that's on the back. To a certain extent, I, think I can sort of respect what Alex is saying, so it kind of um, it chirps in with what you said about being on the fence in terms of how you vote. Um, you know, don't just go and vote yellow, blue, red, or purple, or whatever, because you've always voted like that. Maybe listen to the arguments and then vote. So I can sort of respect where Alex is coming from. I'm personally, I'm personally a fan of the EU, but I think there, there's an awful lot that is wrong with it. I think there's an awful lot that's inefficient about it. I think there's an awful lot that maybe doesn't work in our favour. Um, and I think. Um, if, the, if we were to have a referendum as a Green Party are supporters of it, I think it might go a long way to kind of maybe pressuring um, the issue there. Because I, I think the EU is kind of a nice idea, but I don't know whether it's actually working out in practice. Um, in, terms of, in terms of immigration, I think the idea, um, this is where I'll probably diverge completely from it, I'll get to speak last. So. Um, I think the idea of actually categorising people in terms of their worth, in terms of a point system, in terms of how much money they've got, in terms of the savings they've got, 
is discompassionate and it's inhumane. I think the idea of saying that this, this one person is better than another is, is, is ridiculous. Um, the tightening up that we had on immigration in 2012, I believe, the coalition government brought into um, effect rules where if you're, if you're, if you're immigrating, in one, if you're immigrating in Britain and you're from the European economic area but your spouse is not, you would be allowed in but your spouse would not be allowed in. So the immigration policy we've got at the moment is actually breaking up families. And these are people who are kind of, you know, by and large actually breaking their back and working for this economy. Um, when I was in hospital recently to have a leg operation, everyone who looked after me was an immigrant. There was not one British accent knocking around in there. Immigrants bring, migrants bring a, a net um, income into our economy. Whereas um, I read a study recently that showed that there are more British migrants living in the UK with benefits than there are foreign migrants living in Britain with benefits as well. So freedom of movement, as, as Martin has put, works both ways as well. And I think we really do have to kind of actually have a look into what our problems are in this country and actually point the finger at the real culprits. And I don't think that's immigrants. Um, for our last question, are we going to do it? I, I think we should probably try it out. Sure. Thank you. Hi, I think, um, well, should we get everyone to give a massive round of applause?